Dr. Steve McVeigh is our guest. We're going to be talking about uh, an area of grace today, I think. Steve, what, what, you've got a new book called The Grace Walk Experience. So what area are we going to talk about on the program today? There are eight truths that I wrote about in this book that transformed my life. Today we're going to talk about truth number one. Here it is. Improving your behavior will not give you victory in a Christian life. I used not to think it would, but it won't. So behavior, improving your behavior will not give you victory. If you could suddenly start acting like the Apostle Paul, it wouldn't cause you to have victory because victory doesn't come through changing your behavior. Steve, I'm looking forward to this, Steve. Thank you very much. Hey, you're going to want to stay with us. Thank you for joining us on this new day. Steve McVeigh has been here before, but not for quite a while. I'm really looking forward to hearing from him. He's really sort of the Mr. Grace, I would call him. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Grace. Well, Mr. Incredible, what do you think? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I agree. Okay. I like Mr. Grace. I do. <laughs> we you love know, Steve. When you walk in life, you discover you need grace. Yes. I need mercy and grace are two of the qualities that I need from God above all else, mm -hmm. but also from people. Mm -hmm. And yes. I thank him for his, his, his grace. And these programs, with Steve, I believe are going to be real encouragement mm -hmm. to you. They will help you in the next steps you're going to take. And that's great. Stay with us. I'm delighted that we've got Steve McVeigh, pardon me, Dr. Steve McVeigh, back with us here on It's New Day. Uh, Steve has been with us over the years, probably over the last 10, 11 years. He has been with us as a guest at various times. And uh, Steve, thanks for coming to spend some time thanks, with us. Thanks, Willard. I always enjoy coming here and being with you. Well, well it's been good. And I, I just realized I've got one of your books with me, and I should have had a whole raft of them here to show, and, uh, because you are an author. Yes, I enjoy writing. That's right. See, I don't. I don't enjoy writing. But anyway, that's, that doesn't mean I don't write. I just don't enjoy well, writing. you enjoy talking so much, you don't have time to write. Is that it? <laughs> don't tell everybody. Nobody would know that. <laughs> but anyway, we, the book we're talking about the, with this week, and you'll be with us for, for a number of days, is The Grace Walk Experience. And uh, it ties into a book you've called, I think one of your first books is called Grace Walk, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. My first book in 1995 was uh, published. It was Grace Walk. And... Uh, it's a book that teaches the, the foundational truths of the believer's identity in Christ and how to walk in grace. And the Grace Walk experience now 11 years later is, is uh, an expansion and an extension of all the books that I've written since Grace Walk. Do you, do you, are all your books about grace? They're, all not, they're not all about grace, but they're all written from grace. You see, here's the thing that, w that we fail to understand in the modern church. Sometimes we get the idea that grace is one of the topics of the Bible. No, grace is the all-consuming topic of the Bible. I, I, I go to churches sometime and a pastor will say, you know, this year we're going to focus on grace in our church. And I always think, well, what are you focusing on the rest of the time? <laughs> See, they, they see it like a pie and grace is one slice of the pie among right. many other important things. But I don't see it that way. I see it like instead of grace being a slice of the pie, if you lift the pie up and look, there's the crust. And that crust holds everything else, the, all the filling Right. It holds it all, and that's, that's the way grace is. Grace holds everything else. So, so the grace of God is a fundamental element about how God does function everything? The, the grace of God is everything. <laughs> because the grace of God is personified in, the, in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is life. That's the message of grace. Jesus Christ is the life of our church, of our families, of our careers, of our hobbies. You see what I'm saying? He permeates it all. And so I've written these books, as I say, from a grace perspective, showing how that Christ is all in all. He's everything in our life. Okay, now, is, that's, it's good that we talk about this, because, see, if somebody's come along, and I, like me, and I'd say, <laughs> but God is love. Or can I not separate God's love from grace? Where does that love flow from? It <laughs> flows from out of his grace. That's right. God is love. And, and it is because, the, the, as you say, the love and grace are Siamese twins. The love of God and the grace of God. I always say that the message I teach is the unconditional love and unending grace of God. You can't separate the two. God's grace is manifested in the fact through Jesus that he adores us so much that in eternity past, he said, I'll die without if I don't have you. And I'll die, I'd rather die than live without you. And he, and he did. Not because he needs us. 
but because he wants us. He said, I'll, I'd, I'll, I'll die if I have to, to spend yeah. eternity with you. Yeah. In order to have, in order and, to have you. and actually in order to have you that's restored right. to that's for right. eternity, that's right. I will die for you. It's, I mean, not that's that, it. it's not that God needed us to be fulfilled or complete in himself. He doesn't need us. You know, Acts chapter 17 says, neither is, uh, is, he, is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. But the wonderful thing is, is that God wants us. And I wrote, the Grace, I wrote Grace Walk in 1995 to explain the believer's identity in Christ and what it means to walk in grace. But I wrote the Grace Walk experience, and the key word here is experience. Experience, right, right. Because I, I wanted folks to see that this is not just a theology, it's not just a doctrine, but it is a living truth in Jesus Christ that will transform our lives when we understand how to walk in grace. And so I, and this book okay. really, the, the Race Walk Experience, consists of eight truths that totally transformed my life. And I mean, I'd been a Christian 29 years before God began to teach me these things. I had been a pastor for 17 years before I began to learn the things that I put about and that I wrote about in this book. Eight truths that absolutely transform me. And that's what we're going to talk about, some of those okay, truths. Okay, so, so we'll be getting into that yeah, during yeah, this time. Yeah, absolutely. Is the, the process of that, of that transformation or how yeah, yeah. these truths do are so critical. Yeah, and, and understand when we say these truths, that's important right here at the beginning of this, uh, this, this series of, of programs. It's important for me to say that these eight truths I'm talking about are not like eight secret keys to unlocking your victory in, the, in your Christian life. It's not like some secret key. It's not like some steps you take. These eight truths, understand, are all aspects of the expression of the life of Christ who is in us, through us. All these truths, Jesus is the truth. So all these eight truths that we'll talk about this week are really um, different aspects and facets of how we uh, live out of our true identity in Christ. Does that make sense? Am I, no, no, no. I think, I think yeah, because often we talk about the seven steps to something, yeah, or that, the that's what, five that's steps or something. Yeah. Say, I'll get this step down, then I'll get the next one, and so on. And this is what you're talking about is saying it's a matter of my heart understanding and knowing Jesus. That's right, and knowing who I am in Him, and knowing who I. So that and that's a critical part, isn't that, it? That's the key to me because if you ask the person in the average church, uh, "Do you believe God loves you?" They'll say, "Sure." And, and what they're not saying is, he's God. That goes with the job description. Yeah. Of course he loves me. Yeah, either if I, I, can, I can be living an awful life, but God loves me, and I, I know that's who he is. Yeah. Okay. And, and, that, and that part and is that's true. that's true. But the reality is, what we don't understand in the modern church is what it means to say that we are one with Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, He who joins himself together to the Lord is one spirit with him. What does that mean, we're one with Christ? Well, that's what this Grace Walk experience is about. Oh, okay, okay. So, it, it, okay. It, it's, it, it outlines eight things aspects of what it means to be in union with Jesus Christ. And union is a key word. Here's the thing, Willard, that I didn't understand for 29 years after I became a Christian. Jesus is not in my life. He's not in my life. To say that he is in my life still leaves me as a distinct entity. No, Christ is my life. Now, I don't mean I'm Jesus, but he is my life. He said, so he okay. came into me and transformed <laughs> okay. me and gave me a new nature. And but we're going to have to, you're going to have to spend time with us so we, we get will. this. We, yeah. Okay, because, you know, you, know, you bring, I say, yeah, I can, but then I suddenly say, but, but what does that look like? What does that mean? Or why is that, why is that difference so huge? I mean, it seems huge, but I don't always understand. I mean, so we're, we're kept from understanding some things sometimes that are true in our lives. That's right. Well, let me, let me give you one example of why it's important to understand yeah. Christ is my life as opposed to. Christ is in my life. Well, we, well when, when I was a little child, uh, I, okay, I mean, uh, my mommy, my mama, my mother asked me, you know, and, and my Sunday school teachers, I mean, I remember, because at the age of five, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. That's how I understood it. Mm -hmm. Jesus, you come and live in my heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so I, to me, I was taking him into... Mm -hmm somehow the one who created the universe or was part of the creation mm -hmm. universe, he and his Father and the Spirit, the three in one, made the universe. But somehow he comes and lives in, in my heart. And so and that, there's a truth to that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm not going to nitpick those, those, that expression. I've, I've heard those words used. I've used them. I don't, I'm not going to nitpick that expression as but long I, but as I understand I what it means. But what does it mean? You see, that's the issue. Okay. Well, here, okay. here's the key. To say Christ comes into my life, or uh, unless into I'm my assuming heart, heart yeah. and life we're, is synonymous in the way you're using it, uh, Christ comes into my life. Okay. Um, the, 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 the underlying danger, if we don't understand the full truth, is that I say, okay, Jesus is in my life. 
And then that leads to things like, but you need to make him number one in your life. I know you well, probably I've heard, grew up have that. I heard that one, and right. I used to teach that. You need to make him number one in your life. Okay, well then here's the question. What's number two? If Jesus is number one, what's number two? What's in number three? What's number four? No, Jesus Christ will not be denigrated by being put on a list of things in your life. The truth is, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The only life we have now is Jesus Christ. He said, but the, li the, the life says, I now live, the life that I now live in this physical body, yeah. I live by the faith of the Son of God. You know, oh, later in the Bible, the Bible says uh, in the New Testament, when Christ, who is our life, shall yeah. appear. Right. Yeah. And, and I think it's in the book of Acts. It says, in him we live and move and exist. So to say that Christ came into my life, again, I'm not trying to be uh, nitpicky about no, words, no, but no, words no, no. mean something. <laughs> and we need to understand what we're saying. To say that Christ came into my life, if by that you mean he came into my life and took the person that I was and crucified that old person with him on the cross. And we'll talk about that. Uh, Truth number five, we'll get to that later <laughs> in the week. But if, if we mean he took the person I was, crucified that person, and gave me a brand new life in the place of that which I had, and the new life he gave me is his life, then you'd be right. Then you'd be right to say Christ came. He came into <laughs> yeah. my life, took it, killed it, and started over and gave me a brand new life, which is his life. So now he's not just in my life. It's not like, oh, Jesus is in my life and I need to make him number one. No, Christ is my life. In him we live and move and exist. He lives through us. For me to live is Christ. It, it, and it changes our perspective because now my responsibility is just to trust and rest in him. And it is his responsibility both to will and to do his good pleasure. Which, which Philippians says he did. That's right. That's you know, right. That's what he... I think it says there in that's chapter right. two somewhere. Yeah, that's right. That's why I say that. It's yeah. up to him. We yeah. don't live for him anymore. We don't live for Jesus Christ. No. And again, I, I'm not trying to nitpick words, no, but you I, see. But, but some of those words is, actually bring separation if, from the very thing that God is wanting to work into. Exactly. Us. We need to think about what we're saying and what it means. And to say, well, 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 you know, we live for Jesus Christ. No, you don't. You're never called to live for Christ. We live, you know the message of the New Testament. It's not for Christ. It's in Christ. And those, that, those two prepositions make a world of difference. Because to live for Christ. Yeah, in fact, that's what we, so this really is the issue of the whole week, isn't it? I mean, this it, is it. I mean we're this getting down to a very part. core issue of this thing. This is your book. Grace is the divine enablement by the life of Jesus Christ in us. For us to be all that we've been called to be and do all that we've been called to do. That is grace in essence. As a, now, I'm not talking about for unbelievers. No, I'm no, talking about no, for those we're, of us who are Christians. We're talking about someone who has made a decision to embrace Jesus. That's right. Grace, and let me say it again. Grace is the divine enablement by the life of Jesus Christ in us for us to be all that we've been called to be and do all that we've been called to do. It's not me doing it for him. It is his life coming into me and him living and his, him life doing, and him doing his life through me so that through. I live a miraculous lifestyle that is only possible if you have a miraculous presence dwelling inside you. Now, in contrast to that, and, and, and here's one of the big differences between law and grace, and in fact, in session one, uh, truth number one here, I should say, uh, chapter one, I talk about that, um, that one of the differences between law and grace is law says, you try to do it for him. In grace, God says, no, I'll do it through you. You see, law puts the burden on, on us, but grace leaves the burden where it rightfully belongs, and that's on him. What's our role? To rest in Jesus and let Jesus be Jesus in us and through us. Now, people say that sounds like passivity, but I'll tell you, brother, resting is the most challenging thing I have in my life because my inclination, as is that of every person since the Garden of Eden, is to take over and try to do it myself. That, that, that is the biggest challenge. Oh, absolutely. That's the biggest. As far as I know, that's my greatest vulnerability even until this very moment, and that is for me to try to take charge in my, of my own life and live my life out of my own abilities. That's the greatest vulnerability I can see in my life and in the lives of others. Jesus said, are you, I, I like the way the message, you know, the translation yep, of the Bible yeah. says Peterson's, something like, are yeah. you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me and find rest. And he says, get away with me and I'll teach you how to really live. Watch me and learn the, the natural rhythms of grace or the supernatural rhythms of grace. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Religion makes it so hard. Willard, I'm going to say it right here on Christian television, and, and I, 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 know, I was going to say I hope you'll let me come back the rest of the week, but I know you. You will. <laughs> I, will. I, you, you're, you're, I know I'm <laughs> preaching to the choir with you. But I hate religion. And, and, and let, me, let me clarify what I mean by that when I say I hate religion. Religion is man's attempt 
to jump through enough hoops and to do enough things that he thinks God requires of him that he'll finally be able to get the approving nod from God. That's what religion is. It's us trying to do enough that we can gain God's approval. I hate that because grace is God saying, I love and accept you because, not because of what you have done or will do, yeah. but because of what my son Jesus Christ has done on the cross. It's on that basis that I love and accept you. That's authentic Christianity. And religion blinds us from the truth of the cross. And we're talking about religion. You can be talking about any, any form of religion. We're Listen. Talking, a, a lot of people that are walk, believe they're walking as Christians are still jumping through hoops. Let me tell you, for a long time, I was trapped in religion, and it was the Christian religion. The Christian, listen, and again, let's, uh, you know, we may, may, you may turn your TV off at this point, but I encourage you to stick with us and hear the whole, the whole line of thinking here. But I want to tell you, the Christian religion is no better than any other religion. Now, Christianity, oh, that's a different story. Christianity is wonderful. The Christian religion, I, I, I talked with a, a Hindu guy one time. I was on a flight from Bangkok, Thailand to New Delhi. And I talked with a Hindu guy, and he says, uh, he said, uh, you know the question people ask you all over the world once they know your name, if they want to know more, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, I teach the Bible. He said, the Christian Bible? I said, yes. He said, uh, I, I don't like religion. And I said, I don't either. And boy, I could see that guy's wheels turning in his head, and he sat there a minute, and he said, religion tries to control people. I said, man, are you ever right about that? I said, I, mm -hmm. I, I grew up in the Christian religion. I said, it's as bad as any religion. I could see he, was, he couldn't compute. He, mm -hmm. he couldn't comprehend what I was saying. He said, uh, religion has started a lot of wars. And I said, man, are you kidding? I said, I was a local church pastor for 21 years. I've been in some of those wars. <laughs> <laughs> Not just the international ones. That's right, that's right. The, the war right there. Within, oh, and and finally, this guy looked at me and he said, what did you say you do? <laughs> I said, I teach the Christian Bible. I said, but you need to understand there's a difference between the Christian religion and Christianity. I said, the Christian religion is when a person takes the Bible and they try to they try to build their life around the teaching of the Bible, maybe like a Muslim would do with the Koran. I said, but Christianity is when a person receives Jesus Christ by faith, and he finds his acceptance from God to be in Christ and Christ alone. And we talked about that for a, about an hour on that flight, and it was interesting. Before we landed in New Delhi, this, this guy said to me, Here, I'll never forget what he said. He said, let me see if I understand this. He said, the Christian religion is when you try to build your life around a list of rules and teachings found in the Holy Bible. He said, but the Christian religion, listen to this, what this Hindu said. The Christian religion is when you absorb the life of Jesus Christ by faith into your consciousness. And from that day forward, you don't even live, but he lives his life. Yeah, so the Christian faith, you mean? Christian faith. Christianity, what yeah, Christian yeah, faith, yeah, rather yeah. than Christian religion. Yeah, yeah Christianity, the, Christian right, faith. Yeah, Not, yeah. yeah, the Christian religion is building it around rules. Right. The, the Christ but authentic Christian faith, he said, is when you absorb the life of Jesus Christ into your consciousness by faith, so, the, so that from that day forward, you don't, live, but he lives his life. So yeah, he, so he understood that. He, that, he got thought, the concept. Grief. I thought this Hindu's got it better than a lot of folks back home that go to church every Sunday. Yeah. And, and I'm saying to you, and that's what this is about, how to experience the authentic Christian faith. And what I'm saying, Willard, is a lot of folks are trapped in religion. And I don't mean they're not Christians. Listen, I was a sincere Christian all those years, but I was trapped in faulty thinking. Okay, now what, what does that result in? Okay, if the faulty thinking is there, what, what, what does that what does that kind of do? What, what, what is the result of it? Rather than if you if you got the one and you haven't comprehended the other. Well, I'll tell you exactly what it does, and a, and a lot of you watching this uh, right now, you know exactly what I'm saying, and, and I know you have experienced this in your life, Willard, as I have. When we live with the mistaken notion that Christianity is about me, number one trusting Jesus Christ and being saved by faith, and then, number two, spending the rest of my life trying my best to live for Him, which is a false teaching. When we believe that, what it does is puts us in a place where we, where we will forever, for the rest of our lives, feel nothing but uh, a sense of in, internal death and condemnation. Inadequacy. Inadequacy. Because 2 Corinthians 3, verses 5 and 7 calls the law the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. That's why I use those two words. When you live a legalistic life, and legalism is a system of living where we try to make progress, spiritual progress, or gain God's blessings based on what we do, 
When you live that life, it will always leave you feeling frustrated. It'll leave you saying, why can't I be a better Christian? It'll leave you grading yourself and never feeling like you passed the test. That's what that will do. But understanding the truth of the Grace Walk experience and how to let Jesus Christ live his life through you, what that does is it frees us. It frees us to take our eyes off ourselves and put our eyes first of all on him and then on others. It, 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 it sets us free from that constant uh, self-morbid, self-introspection where we're always looking at ourselves. This goes all the way back to the garden. First thing when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the first thing that happened was they began to stare at themselves and they saw they were naked. And they believed they were un unpresentable. So, so, so the awareness of your own inadequacy is probably the strongest uh, feeling. I mean, if that, if that dominates your thinking, you've got some wrong thinking going on. I, 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 let me qualify that a little bit. I am. I think we should. We are always aware of our own inadequacy. Paul said okay. in Corinthians okay. that our okay. adequacy is not of ourselves. So yes, all through our lives, even as we experience the grace walk, we we'll, recognize our own inadequacy. Right. Okay. But what I'm saying is, when we live on the legalistic side of the of the fence, we experience continuous self condemnation okay. about right. our inadequacy because no matter how hard we try. We can't seem to do enough. Whereas on the grace side of the fence, when we're experiencing the grace walk, yes, we recognize our inadequacy, but that's okay because more importantly, we recognize his adequacy right. okay. and that right. he is our life and we rest in him and we praise him and we know when I'm weak, then I'm strong and we embrace our weakness and lay it and at the foot I'm of the poor, cross. And when I'm poor, I'm rich. And when, that's I mean, right. I mean, that's because right. Because it's something, no, it's what I am in Jesus is what I really am. That's right. In fact, the, the first truth in this in this this Grace Walk experience, the the first uh, week, the first session, uh, I, I'm calling it session because let me let me say something I haven't said. This book is divided into eight weekly. It's it's 240 pages, but it's divided into eight truths, and each truth is divided into five daily studies. So this we're talking about eight weeks of work here. Eight. Well, it's eight weeks of inductive study where you can assimilate truths that will okay. transform you. I love you. it. But week number one, I'm calling it week or chapter right. number one. You, you, can you see what the title is? It says that? improving your behavior will not give you victory in the Christian life. Improving your behavior will not give you victory in the Christian life. And most people think that's what I'm looking for. And okay, well, I'll tell you, we'll take a little break. Okay. We're going to come back, okay? okay? Yeah. We just got started. <laughs> Boy, time flies. It does. Okay, we'll be right back right after this. We're back with Dr. Steve McVeigh. And I do call you Steve more than I call you doctor. Don't even. I, 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 I only have to be a doctor if you feel spiritually sick today. Oh, but, okay. you, you're, but you're not. I know you, so you're good. <laughs> you're just Steve. I, you're my brother. I, I tell folks I got a doctorate degree back then because I served as pastor of so many sick churches. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough. It, it, man, it's a real challenge. But anyway, okay, let's get back to this. Let's, uh, so we're, we're in, in the very foundational, I mean, it's our Christian life. A Christian life, foundationally, right. is uh, w w w where does this, where, you just talked about this difference coming in, where right from the very beginning, Adam and Eve were self-conscious or condemned or felt inadequate and saw themselves that way. Is that a beginning thing? Is that, is that where this whole thing starts? Absolutely. Day three in the Grace Walk experience, first, first truth, day three uh, talks about the difference between law and grace, and, I, and, and uh, I go back to the Garden of Eden in day three here and talk about the two trees and I call one the trying tree and the other the trusting tree. Now remember in the Garden of Eden there were two trees. There was the tree of life. Now that, that tree represents Jesus. We know he is life. That's the trusting tree. But then mm -hmm. I call the other one the trying tree because that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree gave people an understanding of right and wrong. Now, what did God say about that tree? Did he say you need to know right from wrong, so eat from the tree? What did he say? No, he said you don't need He to said eat you from don't that. even need that tree. But now, now listen, to, to see, if this doesn't, if, see if this won't rock the world of, of, of some of you who are watching this. In the beginning, that tree that gave knowledge of right and wrong, God didn't say eat from it so you'll be sure to know right from wrong. God said don't eat from it. Because in the day that you eat from it, you'll, you'll, you'll surely die. Because the issue in the garden was not that they needed to know what was right and what was wrong. The issue in the garden was that they just needed to continue to live out of the union they had with God. And as they lived out of that union, would their behavior be right or wrong? No. It wouldn't be either, Willard, because right and wrong are the boundaries of morality. And they didn't live morally. They lived miraculously. Now, this, this is so fundamental. I mean, Steve, you know, as much as I know this, my mind still struggles with that. When you say that, it, you know, 
I, it's got to be right and not wrong. You well, know, well, that's right. What's the number one question people are asking in church all the time? Would it be right or wrong for me to do this? I know that. And oh, the I answer know. is you're asking the wrong question. The, the response is this. The response, would it be right or wrong for me to do this? Here's your answer. Let Jesus Christ live through you. There's the answer. Because, listen, it doesn't, you don't even have to be a Christian to do the right thing. An unbeliever can choose I, right over wrong. I, I had a real, that, that, it's really true. I had a, a major discussion, it was quite a number of years ago, with a young lady uh, a, a, who is an atheist. And she made no, I mean, we talked about this. And she said, one of the problems you've got is that you think all atheists are immoral. And, and she says, a lot of atheists live more moral lives than people that are Christians. And you know what? I agree with her. I, I, I couldn't argue with her. Yeah, I agree. I, I suddenly realized we've been asking the wrong question. We've That's been, right. We've been going the wrong way on this thing. That's right. The, 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 the key in, in, in answering her objection is this. I, I would have to say to her, you're right. Yeah. I, I'm sorry to say, but the, the modern church, generally speaking, you, you've judged it fairly. But the reality is, from don't judge Jesus no, no. by a lot of what you see in the modern church world, because the reality is, it's not about moral or immoral living. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. That, and I think that's our challenge. But go yeah. ahead. Keep going here, Steve. I don't well, it's not about this. morality. We, again, I say we don't have to have Christ living inside us to live morally. That lady made a good point. She, exactly. But you do have to have Jesus Christ living in you to live miraculously. To live a supernatural that's life, right. you need Jesus. That's you right. cannot live supernaturally without God living his life through you. And here's the key. Again, this first, this first truth we're talking about, improve, improving your behavior would not cause you to have victory in the Christian life. Here's the key. Even if you could change your behavior from wrong to right, you, could, you would still be frustrated. Now, some that are watching this program can relate to where I've been. Okay. I was a pastor, for a local church pastor, for almost 21 years until I left in 1994 to begin Grace Walk Ministries. But, you know, I, was, I did all the right things. I read my Bible every day. I went to church. I even preached the sermon when I got there. I witnessed to unbelievers. I gave my money. I prayed. I did all the things. My behavior was right. But in my heart of hearts, I still felt like there was something missing. I remember thinking, there's got to be more to the Christian life than this. My behavior was not only moral. My behavior was religious. But what coming to understand the truths I wrote about in the Grace Walk experience has done for me is it's caused me to recognize that I was, I was trying to find, my hunger was legitimate, my yep. search was real, but I was trying to satisfy that thirst through morality and religion. And I realize now that, I was, that we're not called to morality, we're called to miraculous living. We're called to a lifestyle that transcends right and wrong. We're called to a life where Jesus lives through us. I was not being called to religion, I was being called to righteousness. And all my religious efforts to step up my activity and pray more, give more, preach more, you know, read the Bible more, etc. It was like drinking. It was like drinking water out of the ocean. It only made me thirstier. It didn't satisfy me. But I'm telling you, I, I travel all over the world sharing this, and you know it, and, and you yeah, watching yeah. at home know it. You go to church next Sunday, and in the typical church, the answer for the frustrated Christian that they're going to hear is, "Well, you just need to read the Bible more, pray more, you know, witness do, more, do the right things, do more. the right things." And we've done that, and we've done it, and we've done it, and we've done it. And the bottom line is, I'm here to say right on national TV, it won't work. The only thing that's going to satisfy that thirst is Jesus and understanding who he is and who we are in him. <laughs> but a lot of people, when you say that, there's going to be a whole, there's, we, there, it's triggers in us, in so many of us, okay, I'll do the right thing then. I'm just I'm just <laughs> telling you, Steve. It's just like uh, you're right. You know, I, I'm going to get to know Jesus. Well, then suddenly I'm thinking, well, that means I'm going to read the Bible more. Then I'm going to pray more. And and you know that is not that's not the answer. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's wrong to do all of those oh, things. Can in fact, if you are living a supernatural life, you probably well, you may end up praying more one day, or you I, may I, end I up. Those things become the natural overflow of the uh, of the uh, of what's the, happening. The excitement we are we have about sharing union with Christ. Those things, of course, 
Please, I don't want anybody to think we're minimizing the value of Bible reading and prayer and church. Yeah. I'm not doing that. But I'm saying we've got the cart before the horse. So we, in the modern church, we think if we'll do all those right things and do them consistently enough and zealously enough that we're going to come to a place of experiencing victory. And again, right back to this first truth, which is what we're talking yeah, right, about today. Right, right, right. Improving your behavior would not give you victory in the Christian life. We think if we could do it well enough, long enough, you know, strong enough, then we're going to experience victory? No, we will not. Now, when we come to understand our identity in Christ, as I teach it in this book, and who we are in Him and who He is in us, once we understand that, then all of the doing of the Christian life will be the natural, or I should say supernatural, overflow of yeah. that love relationship that but, we have but, 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 but that super, that overflow and what that is... Again, it isn't about judging it because someone may live their life of Christ in contemplative prayer. That's right. Somebody may live their life uh, in, in, in exuberant expression of song and dance. And someone may have that overflow and showing up in a different way. And w when we look at someone else, if they're not doing it our way, oh. we want to judge them because they couldn't be living the supernatural life because it's not like ours. And immediately it's telling me, I'm, then I'm looking at the wrong thing in my own life. As soon as I'm starting to look at judge others, now what am I, am I judging myself? Thank you for pointing that out because that's a very good point that needs to be made. As we, as we live our life in Christ, the guy who is particularly gifted for evangelism tends to think you should make evangelism the same priority that, that he does. Whereas the guy over here who's particularly called to, as you say, a deep co contemplative prayer yeah, life, yeah, yeah. he tends to think that the evangelist doesn't recognize the value of prayer. Exactly. And the guy over exactly. here that loves to get into the Word and study yeah, yeah. And, and really and pour himself into the Word, just, just, he just, tends just, to think that you guys ignore the Word. And, and we can't judge each other by our own place. And here's the real tendency, especially when you don't know who you are in Christ. We, we tend to judge ourselves by comparing our weaknesses with somebody else's strengths. So I, if I don't know who I am in Christ, I'll look at the guy who's the evangelist and say, man, I feel so guilty. That guy, he just leads everybody to Christ he meets. Or this guy, whoa, he's such a prayer warrior. My prayer life is so weak, I feel horrible. Or this guy, he's so well-grounded in Scripture. I wish I knew the Bible like that. What's wrong with me? And we compare ourselves with others, now, and it's, a, it's very... a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing, and it does nothing but minister death and condemnation to us. Here's the key. The key is know who you are in Christ, relax, and just be who you are. And, and you know what? And enjoy the gifts that others have. And That's enjoy right. the expression That's right. that others have. <laughs> you, you, you know, I, I pray that people that watch It's New Day, that, that, that have a life in Christ, I mean, that are living their life in Christ, enjoy the life that they see in Christ in others that are on this program, rather than being at one that they compare them and says, I, you know, I'll never match up with Steve. You know, Steve McVeigh, man, is he got it, and I'll never get there. That's, you know, yeah, but absolutely. rather say, you know what, I rejoice. Yeah. I love the expression of life that I see in Steve, that life of Christ that I see bubbling up through him. That's right. You know, and, and releasing that. through him. What a neat thing. Amen. You know, is it like my, no, I, Willard doesn't have the same thing flowing out of him that Steve does. It's a different flow in Willard. Yeah, but that's, that's, right. that's Willard. That's okay, right. now what about Betty? Now what about you? Okay, I mean, I mean isn't, isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that the issue? That's exactly it. And you know what? The truth is, what, what, what you guys at home don't know is if, if we were sitting in the living room with somebody watching this right now, we would see gifts and strengths in those people. Precisely. You, you, you know, you, you see on TV what we're showing you. You know, you don't know those days that I'm discouraged. You don't know. I'm not, I'm not talking about that today. Not no. that I'm unwilling to talk. Though there are some things I wouldn't tell you, but you know what I'm no, saying. No, no, I'm not, no. You don't know about the days that I'm discouraged. You don't know about the days that I feel fearful because, you know, my, my faith falters. And I'm saying, Lord, are you going to come through in this area, that area? You, you, no. We, we, all have, we all have strength and weakness, strengths and sure weaknesses. We and we, we just come to a terrible point where we judge ourselves by the strengths we see in other people. I, I, I can see that. I, it really becomes a, a very a negative thing. It puts us right back in this prison house that, that Truth One in the book talks about, and that is then I think, oh, then I need to, I need to improve my behavior. I need to change yeah. the way I am in that area. I see these strengths in Willard. I need to be more like Willard. No, 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 no. no it's, 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 it's how do I let Jesus, who is my life, That's right. flow out of me? That's right. Where am I? Do we talk about the hindrances of, these, uh, of, of his life in us? Do, it, I mean, yeah. I don't know whether we get to, what, what day do we get to that? <laughs> well, you know, I'll, 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 I will go ahead and address that now okay. in a short, short way. The, I think the, the biggest hindrance for most of us that are, that are involved in this program, those of you watching and, and us, I think the biggest hindrance that we tend to face is, is um, 
lapsing back into a self-sufficient religious lifestyle. Does it, it slips easy? Hmm? It slips back into that easily? It, it, you, we have to be vigilant against it because especially if you grew up in church like I did, I was taught to be a good religious boy. I mean, I, I don't ever remember not going to church. My, my dad was a leader in the church. My mom taught Bible study classes. I mean, I, all my life I went to church. I can, man, I can talk the King James English. You know what I'm saying? I can put on this religious mask and, yeah, I, I, can, I can, man, just point at me on cue. I can become religious for you. But, you know, that's not what I want to be anymore. I don't want to be that. I just want to be real. I just want to be authentic in my faith. But I find in my own life that when I lapse, mm -hmm. uh, my tendency is to mm -hmm. go into the religious mode. And, 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 mm -hmm. and some that are watching this, they're trying to fill their spiritual hunger by teaching a Bible study class. They're trying to fill their spiritual hunger by thinking, you know, if I'll just do more at church, then I'll be, I'll be happy. If I, I'll be victorious, I'll have peace. But again, it's a subtle distinction, but it's, 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 ever, it's so dangerous. If we think we're going to find fulfillment by what we do for Christ, we're, gonna, we're in for a long disappointment because the only fulfillment will come from Christ. Mary and Martha know, is a good picture. Yeah, you yeah, remember yeah. about Martha? The Bible yeah. said she was distracted with much service. In Luke, I believe it's Luke 10. Yeah. There's the exact verse, New American Standard Version. It says, but Martha was distracted with much service. Here's the question. Who was she serving? She wasn't serving Jesus. She, she was doing I mean, stuff I mean, she for she Jesus. Thought she, she thought was. she was. She thought she was. Though. But my point is, her, her attempt to serve Jesus is what was distracting her from Jesus. Because what was Mary doing? Mary was resting in that union, in that intimacy. Martha was trying to do something for him. And Martha was, Jesus said it. She said, you're worried and troubled about so many things. Here was Martha worried and troubled while she was trying to serve Jesus. And here was Mary just resting in peace in Christ. And that's the danger I face, you face, you face. Well, I, it, 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 it's, it's a danger I face. I, I know just need to I, do more for Jesus and then I'll find the peace. No, you won't either. No. In fact, it's interesting what Jesus said in that passage in Luke 10. If it had been me, I would have said, Martha, you're a good woman. I appreciate you. I love you. But what Mary's doing has value too. Martha, you need to learn balance. Isn't that what we'd say? You need balance. Yeah, that's what we'd say. Yeah. Sounds good, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus, <laughs> you, know, you remember what Jesus said in Luke 10? Jesus said, Martha, only one, one thing, thing is needful. Not and balance. Mary's found it. He didn't say you need you balance. Know, you're right, Isn't Steve. that weird? Oh, man. I mean, how many of us have, I mean, I've preached balance. He didn't say you need balance. Oh, he man. said only one thing is needful, and Mary's the one that found she's it. Found, she's found what is life. That's right. Now, does that mean that service isn't important? No. I often teach that passage, and I say, if Jesus had said, I sure am thirsty, I'm thirsty, what do you think Mary would have done? She would have been off to the kitchen it, to get him some water. Martha, on the other hand, was out in the bedroom making his bed. He wasn't sleepy. He was thirsty. But Martha was doing something for Jesus he didn't even ask her to do while Mary was resting just at his feet in intimacy with him. And anything that Jesus wanted her to do, she'd spring into action just that quickly and do it. But Martha was distracted with much service. And Jesus said, because of it, you're worried and troubled about many things. And some, somebody who's watching this, is that, that, that you're, you're all stressed out and you're, you're really working hard in your church and you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing this and you're doing that and you're wonder, wondering why you're not fulfilled and why you're frustrated, welcome to the Martha Club. That's, it's because we, we are, and I've done it. I, I'm talking to myself. Uh, you're too close to home, Steve. I think we better get off that topic. <laughs> <laughs> That's my tendency, you know. But, but you know, I, I uh, this is, I, I, you know, sorry for, no, I'm, I'm thankful that you brought this up, the balance thing, because that's, that has been our, our response. You've got to get a right balance between service and setting, resting and service. I mean, that's, we talk about it, and you see, that's absolutely, it, we're, now it's the tree of good and evil again. That we've, we've moved right into that whole tree idea because it's, it's us knowing what's the balance. How we do it, when you say it should be living out of the tree of life instead of out of that, the good and the evil. The, the, I'm glad you said that because this is a lie in the modern church, and here's the lie. We must find a proper balance between rest and service. That's a lie. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. We serve while we rest. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. How can you endlessly run and walk without getting weary or collapsing? The answer is because you're not doing it in your own strength. If it is Jesus Christ animating your life, you can run 
endlessly without growing weary. So do you understand what I mean when I say yeah. we serve yes. and rest at yes. the same time? Yes, yes. Because you're resting in his, in him doing it. That's you, right. You're resting in him. You, you see, oh man. A.J. Gordon, you, you remember that preacher years ago, told a story one time about being at the World's Fair and he said, I saw a guy and he said he was, he was, he was pumping water in the distance and I looked and he had a pump handle and he was vigorously pumping the water and he said, I watched, and that guy was just going at it, just, just frantically, just, just strenuously pumping, pumping, pumping. And he said, I watched, and boy, oh boy, he just seemed to do it tirelessly. And he said, I walked over closer, and he said, I got closer and closer, and the guy never broke stride. He kept going and going and going. And he said, finally, I got up close enough to see that I had misjudged what I was looking at. He said, it was actually a mechanical man. And he said he wasn't pumping water. He said it was water from an artesian well spilling up out of the ground, and it was turning a, a, a gear. And it, it was actually turning a wheel. Exactly. The water itself was turning he, the wheel. He and said made this it wasn't guy... the man pumping the water. It was the water pumping the man. <laughs> that you, is a you, good, get the, you get my point. That is a great You picture. get my point. Yeah, yeah. It's not, we don't, Jesus said the river of living water will flow from your innermost being. We don't pump it out. He pumps it out of us. We don't pump. He does. And that's what keeps us animated and going. That's, without collapsing. That's the, flow, the flow from within flows out. That's right. You, and many of us are trying to generate a flow. That's what religion tells you to do. I'll tell you, I have walked down the aisle all during the, you know, my Christian life until, until God began to teach me this. I grew up as a child walking down that aisle and rededicating myself to try harder time and time and Every time Sunday and time night. again. I did that. And no matter how hard you try, it won't work. Didn't work. Steve, I'm going to take a little break. Okay. We'll come back and, and uh, oh man, and conclude this portion of it. But uh, this, I, keep, I wanted you to say it again and again because I'm really, you're hitting me, you're touching me you're in, in areas where I need to be reminded very strongly. I do too. We all so do. So thank you. Yeah. We'll take a break and be back. We'll be back with Steve McVeigh right after this. Your copy of today's program can be purchased by requesting the program number on the screen. Write, call toll-free, or visit online at www.newday.org. With Mother's Day coming up, we want to give you some gift suggestions. One of them being the book I wrote, and it's a cookbook, Tastefully Yours. I highly recommend it. She's got some great stuff in there. And also, we'd like to invite you to go to www.newday.org. That is our website in which there is a web shop. And if you click onto the topics and click Mothers, there will be some mother-related material, books and other gift ideas you will want to take a look. And also, as you're thinking about how to honor your mother in the best way possible, you can give a gift in honor of your mother and make it a gift that you really feel would be an honoring and, and a book that would just, I mean, a gift that would just really give glory to the Lord and a grateful heart for what you have received from your mother. Thank you so much for being a partner with It's a New Day. Give today. We're back with Steve McVeigh, and uh, Steve, we've been talking about just the beginning of a book called The Grace Walk Experience. I mean, some of the truths. We're talking about the truth mm -hmm. that the Lord has really impacted your life with. I mean, you, this is your experience. This is, and, and you're saying, look, I want to share this with others because it's so prince, uh, foundational. Yes, I think I'm so typical. I'm so typical in that I, I became a believer and was very sincere, but I struggled, and I lived in that motivation, condemnation, rededication cycle That's for simple, years and yeah. years. And the Lord finally began to teach me these truths that I write about in this book and set me free from that. And I'm enjoying, I was a believer 29 years before God began to teach me these things, but I'm enjoying the Christian life that the Bible talks about now instead of the one that I grew up thinking was the Christian life. Wow. Tomorrow, what are we going to talk about? Well, tomorrow, today we've talked about session one uh, improving your behavior will not give you victory in the Christian life. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the second uh, chapter, and that okay. is problems in your life could be the best thing that could happen to you. And I'm going to talk about how God uses problems to bring you to the place where, so, where so, he can cause these to become a reality okay, so, so, to you. So sometimes the very things that look like hiccups or you know, roadblocks in our life are the very things that God is going to use to bring us into a place of knowing who he is. Absolutely. And who we are in him. I, I'll tell you, I, tomorrow I'll tell you about... Uh, I'll tell you about the, the, the worst night of my life spiritually, and it was when I prayed and said, God, if this is ministry, I quit, and if this is the Christian life, it's overrated. 
And I tell you now, that was in 1990. I tell you now, looking back, that was the best moment of my Christian walk. I'll <laughs> okay. tell you why tomorrow. Okay. So the very How's that important. for a tease? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good tease. I can go with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Steve, if people want to get in touch with you, you have a phone number, you have a website. Absolutely. Can do that? In fact, let me say this. We are opening a Canadian office, Grace Walk okay. Canada. And uh, you can find out more about the uh, Canadian uh, office, Grace Walk, by writing Mike Zinker. Michael Zinker is our director for Grace Walk Canada. And you can write him at uh, Mike at GraceWalk.org. But if you want a copy of the Grace Walk Experience, you can, uh, you can call our office at 1-800-GRACE-11. That's easy to remember. Maybe you can put the regular number on the sure. screen. But it's 1-800-GRACE-11. Or visit our website at gracewalk.org. You can get this Grace Walk Experience as well as my other books and recorded teachings and all of that stuff. Steve, we'll find you. Yeah. Actually, I was there the other day on the web. I just want to say, I just want to see what your website looked like. Yeah, so yeah. I went there. And we'll, by the way, we'll have a link between our website at uh, newday.org and, uh, and Steve's as well. So Great. We'll take a break now and be back with more of it today and say thanks, Steve. And Thank you'll you. be back with us to, you've teased us where we're going tomorrow. So thanks. Looking forward to that. <laughs> we'll be right back right after this. How can our problems be the best things that ever happened to us? Maybe because our troubles are the best place to connect us with the grace of God. When bad things happen, our problems may be the best thing that could ever happen to us. That's what chapter 2 is about. In five days, we study that in this chapter as to how God will use it to accomplish His purpose in our lives. And that's why people say, well, I'm just going to file for divorce. I'm just going to leave this job. I'm just going to leave this church. I'm just going to do... They want to bring quick closure to something. More from Steve McVeigh on the next program. Enjoy having Steve McVeigh with us. Be sure to stay with us for this entire series. Now that you've been with us one show, I know you're going to want to. Here's the good thing. You can view the program online. Let's say you only caught part of it or, you know, you came part way through. Or maybe tomorrow you aren't able to be there at the same time. Right. So this entire series, you can stream online at www.newday.org. Tell your friends and go and watch. And you know, I also just want to remind you that it really is your gifts that make this program possible. That means that your investments are absolutely vital in order for this ministry to continue. And we really do appreciate it. When you just pray and ask God what your part could yeah. be because every gift makes a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. And it's really God's grace that enables us it to is. give because it it's out of His grace and His love that we want to be cheerful And it's an often a step of faith. It is. Well, I just want to say thanks for being with us today. And tomorrow will be a good day. Yes, it but will. But today's a good day because Jesus is with us and He walks with us all the way. Thanks for very much. Bless you. How can our problems be the best things that ever happened to us? Maybe because our troubles are the best place to connect us with the grace of God. When bad things happen, our problems may be the best thing that could ever happen to us. That's what chapter 2 is about. In five days, we study that in this chapter as to how God will use it to accomplish His purpose in our lives. And, all. and that's why people say, well, I'm just going to file for divorce. I'm just going to leave this job. I'm just going to leave this church. I'm just going to do... They want to bring quick closure to something. More from Steve McVeigh on the next program. People in Canada are searching for hope, and they can find it each weekday through It's a New Day. Thank you for your gift. It makes a difference for eternity.